Welcome to ICOR's April webinar. We will be talking about how to manage risk to the data center. Our speaker today is Jim Nelson. He is the president of Business Continuity Services. He's also the ICOR board chair. And thirdly, he is an Intertech auditor. He has expertise in business continuity as well as all things technology, and he serves as a lead auditor for the ISO standards 22301. 27,001 series, 9,000, as well as 20,000. He is an expert member of ISO Technical Committee 292, which is a committee focused on continuity and resilient standards. Today, we're going to talk about different risk categories um, and suggested controls for the data center. We will also be talking about the impacts of outages and what are some of the costs of data center outages that you should consider. And thirdly, we're going to look at data centers of the future with everything as a service. As usual, um, the recording of this webinar will be available on the iCore webinar page in two days, as well as in our um, YouTube page. If you have questions, use the questions button. Um, I will be monitoring the questions, and if I need to interrupt Jim to ask a question, I will. Otherwise, we will at, answer them at the conclusion of the webinar, or if we don't get to all the questions in an email after the webinar. You will need to attend um, at least 35 minutes in order to receive your certificate of attendance. So let's get started with our first poll, kind of to figure out um, who's here. And so look um, which of the following best describes your role in managing risk to the data center or any other critical environment? And we'll give you about 30 seconds. So it is your primary role. It is not my primary role, but I work in the data center. Or it's not my current role, but it is of interest to me in the future. About 10 more seconds. Okay. These are interesting results. 60% um, of you, it's not your current role of interest, but it is of interest to you. So that is really interesting, actually, on our end. And about 28% of you have it as your primary role and another. So, you know, 28, 38, about 40% of you are working in the data center is my guess on this, and about 60% of you um, are working in and around the data center, but learning here to learn more. So with that, I am going to hand the controls over to Jim, and give me one second to do that. And he will take over from here. Jim, make sure that you're unmuted. I am unmuted. And just a comment on that. I think the two biggest lessons learned during the last three years of COVID is when to go on mute and when to come off of mute. I'm sure we've all experienced that. So for personal reasons, I kind of picked this up because it has something to do with our family. And when we, little kids that we watched this classic and the impact uh, on the family. So on the left-hand side, it's kind of like lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Just a way to take a different perspective about different types of risk on the data center. And as things have changed over time, just kind of that look, Toto, I've got a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. So we see significant changes. So I'll list these up and talk for a few moments. However, Linda, thank you for that introduction. And it is interesting to see uh, the interest levels and from the poll. I'll just insert just a thought here. This is very unscientific, but it is 
some thoughts and trends that I've experienced in considerations. So basically, every week for a very long time throughout COVID, I've had the chance to either uh, review or audit or be exposed to a significant number of companies across significant business sectors. A lion's share of that, lions and tigers and by, <laughs> oh my, a lot of that has been as an ISO lead auditor and looking at trends and how these organizations are dealing with integrated management systems in the risk-based standards and also some i -Corps organi organization resilience capability assessments. What does that mean? I've looked and viewed and assessed and been exposed to almost a new data center or critical environment every week. Along with that, I've looked at how people are dealing with across many regions and business sectors, their risk programs. So I factored in a little bit of that since we have one hour. This topic could go on for an extended period of time because it's very complex. So again, that's just some feedback and thoughts and ideas, and maybe some tidbits I can drop in there from observations. First, before I get into it. Can I interrupt you for a second, Jim? We have at least one person having audio problems. Um, I just sent out a chat. If if there's anyone else having audio problems, can you raise your hand? Otherwise, I'm, otherwise um, we'll keep going. I just want to make sure I can hear you OK, but I but I, uh, we have at least one person who's trying everything and, and lost the audio when we moved. Everybody else says they're good, so we'll keep going. Sorry about that, CJ. Okay, thank you, Linda. No issues. Before I dive into some of these common risks categories, or like I like to say, some of the round up the usual suspects, a trend I am seeing is still there's a very high percentage of companies or organizations that are either fully remote or in a hybrid mode. My definition, I've really come up with three categories. One, as I interview or assess or audit these companies, uh, I looked for percentages that are on site returning. I put a big O on that. And then I put an H on those that are hybrid and the percentage of the employees or participants. And then finally, a trend that's really been changing in the last three years are the remote workers. I've seen that number spike significantly. It's like, yes, I was hired in the last year or two, but I was hired to be a complete remote worker at these client audiences, meaning it's very rare that they have an assigned street address or office to go to, and they're able to effectively do their jobs in a remote capability, which from an ICT perspective, perspective or from a technical information communication technology perspective, there's some risks in there but there's also some opportunities. So pre-COVID, it may have been more normal for an organization that was looking to hire somebody, they might've had a limited target search. Maybe it's within an hour or two or close proximity of the site these people would be working on. With that remote factor coming in, that offers some opportunities that you have a significantly larger pool of potential talent that you can uh, recruit from to be able to meet your job opportunities. And there's also an additional trend. There's trend in that more organizations over the last three years from an ISO standards perspective are doing 
integrated management systems, and more importantly, integrated management systems audits, taking advantage instead of having multiple audits throughout the year, saying, why don't we do this all at the same time and have a team in place? So that is a significant change globally that's been occurring, which aligns nicely with the ISO design of consistency and it's Excel. So let's look at the common risk categories, the usual suspects. Most of you are probably familiar with the external risks that we've been dealing with, whether it's natural disasters, man-made disasters, supply chain issues, or civil disruptions. Then there's the traditional facilities risks, whether it's infrastructure, power, cooling in a critical environment, communications, physical and cybersecurity. Then the third aspect is the data system risk, communications and networks, shared servers, whether they're on-prem, hybrid, or in the cloud, or some version of the cloud we'll talk about later. And then the bad actors, whether it's viruses, or malware, or ransomware, and those trends. And then the challenges of data backup and storage and managing software applications. Finally, to the far right, dealing with cloud vendors, sorry about that, I clicked the wrong button. Those of you that have moved to the cloud or a cloud first strategy or some hybrid or considering it, there are different issues and considerations that we'll talk about. So some of the external risk, natural disasters. Of course, mother nature is a wild card and we're all familiar with hopefully this is improving in some regions but supply chain disruptions whether it's for technology electronics embedded trips or transport then controlling some of those external risk traditional things that we've done in the past is how do i pick where my data center is going to be is it some site selection? Is it gonna be in a city in an urban environment or in a suburban or on the fringe in a green field? And you also look at proximity risk being, who are my neighbors and what do they do and what's going on around that can affect me? And in the past weeks, uh, we've seen many issues where there's something that happens in a community whether it's a rail issue or a hazmat issue that then impacts residents in that community. We also have the traditional site selection issue. Are you in a seismic zone or not? And how do you plan for that? And water, I'm saying too much or too little, which we'll talk about later. You know, are you in a an area that's prone to a lot of water or are you more arid condition? Finally, in that Election traditionally in the centers in critical environment, we've always looked at accessibility and transportation and various public utilities in the West that are availability. And then we look at the engineering aspects. How do we engineer? How do we harden that design? What are architectural and engineering considerations? How much redundancy is appropriate? And what kind of designs can you take and put in place in engineering for wind or earthquakes or severe weather conditions, heat and cold to ensure the instructional integrity? Or do you have storm shutters or something that you're able to lock down your facility? So we've got great experience with that, but things are continuing to change. An additional issue. There's a huge reliance on water for cooling in certain regions, mostly in the West, and it's a growing, growing challenge. As compute needs, the ability to cool and condition that environment increase. And we're also dealing with the global supply chain and climate change issue 
which then compounds that and exacerbates that. So in a moment, I'll show you a short video. And part of that is on water scarcity and how it impacts climate risk. So a study done by Arman, who is a researcher over at the Lawrence Berkeley Livermore National Labs. And ICOR is very familiar with LBL and works collaboratively. Part of that is their research shows a high percentage, 20% of data centers in the US have a heavy reliance on watersheds or on sources of water that are under moderate to high stress, whether it comes from drought or other factors. So give me a moment here to bring up and share my screen and we'll watch a quick short video. Data centers are part of the lifeblood that powers big tech names like Meta and Google, and they face rising risks from climate change. Here's Diana Olick with a deep dive on that story. Data centers store and transfer all the digital information we use, which is a lot and growing. So they run very, very hot. The cheapest and most common way to cool them is water, a lot of it. Water tends to be much cheaper than power, and so it's a pure financial decision for many players. In just one day, the average data center could use 300,000 gallons of water to cool itself, the same water consumption as 100,000 homes, according to researchers at Virginia Tech, who also estimated that one in five data centers draws water from stressed watersheds, mostly in the West. There is, without a doubt, risk if you're dependent on water. These data centers are set up to operate 20 years. So what It, so you get a sense that water is a major issue and we're seeing the research of that and the dependencies. So I'm going to talk a little bit about controlling some of the facility risks. These are not exhaustive. It's just a sample. Anybody who's been involved in a data center design selection over the past decades knows that this is a significant effort. Just highlight in a few of those because I have had the opportunity to participate or assess these efforts. Some of the architectural elements is what type of building structure you're going to have. Are you going to put a data center in a commercial building or a headquarters along with office space? Is it standalone? What materials are you going to use? Is it brick and mortar, tilt up construction? Is it going to be above ground? And how tall is it going to be? Or in some cases, are you going to bury it or put it in a cave or repurpose and get it below ground? There's also, how do you design the space for use not only for the critical compute, traditionally either the raised or non-raised floor area, and then the supporting physical plant infrastructure then you get into budget considerations, which is a huge driver for most organizations. Are they gonna own their own data center or critical environment? Are they gonna lease it or did some kind of uh, business hybrid mode of that? And is it going to be a new design build, something coming out of the ground for the first time? Are you repurposing an existing facility? Uh, to fit your current requirements? Are you going to make the decision as an individual to have your data center, your servers, your pro processing capability on-premise and self-managed? Or are you gonna do some type of hybrid solution using managed service options? And there's many different ones that we'll see later in this presentation. Some of the most common is either hosting or co-location or going to some version of a cloud. 
An additional key piece of facility risk is what kind of talent is available and work, gets, work skill sets that you can draw on the talent pool locally or to support that facility. So I kind of put in here the information communication or technical talent, and then the physical plant or facilities, and that might be more of your tradesmen, blue collar facilities and the talent pool, and what kind of suppliers, vendors, or contractor availabilities in place specific to your data center or critical environment. And some just a very short but representative list is additional considerations. Do I have enough space for future expansion? I need to consider data center security. At the physical plant level, I need to also look at cyber information security. I need my uptime performance. Sorry about that. Hang on, click the wrong button. And then I need the data center is designed to be available and it's designed to perform at certain standards or specifications. And that drives overall the organization employee productivity. Downtimes means loss of productivity. The Internet of Things, I'll just touch on that. That's become a popular term in the last few years. And that's being able to range and manage many more connected devices, either internal to your data center or external or environmentally or across your business network. And then it ties into what kind of networking and cabling is best. We're past the time of doing weekly reports. So we need real-time reporting as things evolve and change. Most of you are probably familiar with having a mobile enterprise, working from anywhere, working from home, hoteling, working at client sites, and making sure that capability is in place and supported. In addition, managing condition power. And along with all of that is capacity planning for all of these things, plus many more across the board. So it's not easy and it's becoming more complex. So a few ideas on the facility's risk maintenance procedures. There's several different schools of thoughts. Do I do preventative maintenance? And the idea is maintain the device or the equipment or the system before there's a problem or a fault occurs. There's also predictive maintenance, and that's trying to look into the future and trend the equipment and uh, anticipate and predict to do the maintenance before the equipment or the device or the system fails. Then there's also corrective maintenance. And part of that is when a problem occurred, then you respond and redress it. And that may also surface while you're doing these other types of maintenance. Finally, there's deferred maintenance. And this has occurred in many cases over the last three years. And you're going to push it off and defer it and not do it. And on the flip side, some forward thinking organization has said during COVID, and we've seen it at airports, physical plants, infrastructures, data center. What can I do when I have some availability and low occupancy? Okay. Following your proper maintenance procedures gives you some additional levels of controls. And most reviewers, assessors, and auditors from the third party are looking at these types of procedures and policies you have in place. And these should be actively managed aggressively internally. I just put an X on this. Deferred maintenance just means you're kicking the can down the road and you're going to probably have those problems, but they will be larger than you anticipate. Not a recommended strategy. 
Then we have data system risk. So it's not uncommon to have a security command center or uh, then a system security, a SOC or a NOC, and they would be monitoring your CCTV or your security cameras, any kind of access control around that cr uh, critical environment, and looking at other devices that may be connected to physical security systems that may be a source of vulnerability. And from our national director of GenTech, recognizing a trend, hackers now because of the internet of things and our connected world can access an organization server room through other paths it might be a surveillance camera they might be able to get access through a device or smart controls or maybe even uh, through a vulnerable uh, employee or resource or assets devices. So some of the usual activities that are involved that are required by ISO and other standards and compliance, NIST, et cetera, talk about controlling risk to your data. And those may be legal or regulatory, if those apply to your organization. It may be looking at your compliance, to your commitments out there or your requirements, having a robust risk management framework system and capability, and then continuing those activities as we mentioned in maintenance, but your overall procedures. And there's some acronyms that are in pretty common use in data centers and critical environments. MOPs, method of procedures, SOPs, standard operating procedures, or EOPs, which are emergency operating procedures, what happens when something is out of tolerance or something breaks. And controlling those, you need to be doing reviews and audits and looking consistently at the environmental aspects where you operate, including the water issue that we've already seen. Some other activities, Pen testing, penetration testing, that's short for that, can internally or through a third party, can you review and see if you have any vulner vulnerabilities that you discover that can be exploited by a bad actor? All of the things on the left then give you activities, how do I enhance my controls? Or do I need to get more aggressive? or more robust with my reviews or internal assessments and audits. And then if you're subject to any third party assessments, and finally I mentioned certification since I spend a lot of time in there. ISO, International Standards, NIST, HIPAA, SOC, CMMI, PII is personal identifiable information and there's standards on all of these. And again, just activities related around risk and cybersecurity. Then managing your cloud and vendor management risk. You're transferring and you're sharing the risk. As more and more companies turn to software as a service type base provider, and they move their data or their operations or their critical environment into a version of the cloud, third-party risk has become one of the most critical topics for in organizations and being able to track those third-party risk and being able to uh, analyze and work with them to get them aligned and compliant with your capability. Part of the cloud and vendor risk management, depending on your agreement and who you're working to, who you're working with, you might have limited visibility into network operations and inadequate due diligence. You may have a dependency on them 
and it may not meet your requirements or you may be restricted in being able to assess and analyze that. Of course, there's malware attacks. Malware attacks, sorry about that. Most cloud providers are pretty robust on having security controls in place, but they're also under deeper and continuing uh, uh, attack and analysis to look at what services they're offering. In addition, compliance, mostly around data, data privacy, as I'd mentioned on the previous slide, what are your privacy requirements? And is there any personal identifiable information? And we've seen quite frequently in the news recently where data leaks or there's data breaches or information goes outside of our organization, either at your organizational level or most recently at the Department of Defense level in the United States. Different ways you can control and work in the cloud and vendor management. Part of that is doing a cybersecurity risk assessment. How robust is your cybersecurity posture and how viable and what's the efficacy of your concern of your existing security controls? And then user access controls. How widely, how closely is that controlled? And here's zero trust, which means basically you don't trust anybody in an open network. <laughs> and they're given access, need to know based upon their role. And if their role changes, that access is then reviewed and modified as appropriate. As you can imagine, that keeps your IT and your technical specialists quite busy. Use of automation, artificial intelligence, capabilities and trending to automate as many cybersecurity monitoring capabilities as possible, monitor your threat intelligence and vendor risk management so the team can then prioritize and address issues or exposures uh, at the highest level. What does that mean? Vigorous and continuous monitoring, staying on the alert, you can no longer rely at any kind of point in time assessments or reports, which means more and more security training to a deeper and broader audience. And some of this can be provided through third parties or cloud storage providers that train you on how to operate in the cloud and the proper controls so you take full advantage of the security offerings in place. Emerging risks. Give me one second. Not quite sure that so far in the past that you would have a complaint about your data center being too loud. But here we go, we'll bring this one up. People of Manassas aren't happy with the noise coming out of new Amazon data centers today. They begged the County Board of Supervisors to do something about it. Katie Barlow was there with what they had to say. Homeowners that live about two minutes from where I'm standing that live right here by what you can see is a pretty sizable Amazon Web Services data center next to me say that the constant noise from this building has been, quote, catastrophic, causing migraines, preventing newborns from being able to go to sleep, adults too, and residents say that it has generally prevented them from being able to enjoy the quiet life they thought they were settling in for here in Manassas. Many people are experiencing sleep impacts caused by Amazon's noise. Sleep disruption has increased their stress and anxiety levels. This irritating sound has exacerbated migraine issues and in one case is contributing to a worsening sim symptoms for a rare autoimmune disorder. One migraine sufferer replaced every window in his home and was forced to move the nursery for their newborn to the basement to protect their infant. 
Today's message was aimed directly at government officials here in the county. Residents said they have spoken to Amazon about internal fixes, but they want local officials to recognize the burden the data centers have created. That includes amending the Prince William County noise ordinance that was adopted in 1989 and has not been updated since. Residents showed me noise decibel readings they took on their own. They showed me readings during the day and night that exceeded what's allowed under the county ordinance. In an article by Harvard Medical School, they state that noise pollution is more than a nuisance. It's a health risk. They go on to state that research has shown noise pollution can cause or worsen cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, sleep disturbances, stress, mental health, and cognition problems, the list goes on, including memory impairment and attention deficits, childhood learning delays, it's great to have next to our schools, and low birth weight. Do we really want those health risks next to our residential homes and our children's schools? No. no. Spencer Snackard, who you just heard from, was actually visiting Prince William County from the neighboring Fakir County, where Amazon apparently and reportedly has uh, eyes on building data centers there as well. So Spencer wanted to attend today to protest Amazon moving into Fakir County. We also just got a statement from Amazon. Uh, we were not able to hear back from Prince William County officials, but Amazon says that addressing noise concerns is a highest priority level. And actually beginning on Friday, they started putting in noise. Okay, I'm going to do one more quick video here, and then we'll continue to move on. Triple-digit heat hits a Twitter data center frying equipment. The social media company says service was not interrupted, but what does it mean for the future of the company in Northern California? CBS 13's Laura Hayfley is getting answers from a local data storage company questioning the platform's ability to stay here. Typically, you hear on Twitter about either you know, the words Twitter meltdown, you think of things like celebrities or politicians and not their actual data centers. Twitter's Sacramento data center is housed in facilities like these. But during last week's heat wave, CNN reports the center and the equipment inside overheated. For a data center to overheat is a pretty special event. Jeff Dunworth is the co founder of Vast Data, a company focused on data storage infrastructure. An average data center is typically composed of a bunch of servers that are used to process application uh, information. But on September 5th, the local temperature reached 115 and Twitter's Sacramento systems failed. The internal temperature of the data center got to a point where the organization felt that it could no longer keep these servers online. Twitter tells CBS 13 users in Northern California were not affected. When Sacramento gets shut down because it's overheating, those customers get rerouted to either Portland or Atlanta. But with temperatures on the rise, Denworth says the threat of the surrounding centers also shutting down could be imminent. What you never heard. Okay, you kind of got a sense on some of the environmental aspects. So we've talked about your cloud is too loud and high temperatures. So back to Linda for a quick poll. And we'll give you about 20 more seconds. So pick one of these that the most keeps you awake at night. And about five more seconds. So interestingly, the data that we're seeing in your response is pretty similar to what we're seeing um, around the world. And with with the um, uptick of malware and viruses and all the hack, all the different ways of hacking, that the data center risks themselves, the data system risks, I should say, are becoming um, more and more prevalent and they're rising to the top. Um, 
it used to always be that external risks and your kind of facility type of risks were hitting at the top, but you're also seeing the cloud as, as more people are using the cloud and using more and more vendors that that's also rising to the top. So these are all, the three are pretty evenly scored with the data system risks now jumping up ahead of the rest, which is what we're seeing in all different studies around the world. So you guys are right on target there. Okay, these are just some example information that comes from Logic Monitor, and they looked over time. Pardon me on that. You know, and what are some of the causes? As you can see, and I'll just sample some of the grays. Network failure, human error are pretty common. Usage spikes or surges are pretty common. Software problems, loss of power third-party providers, et cetera. So here are some of the key outage causes and impacts studied on a global basis. So what does an outage mean? This is some research that has been done by Uptime. A very high percentage of data center managers and operators have experienced some type of outage in the past three years and that's the COVID period. And the, the cost is extensive and they continue to grow from pre-COVID to current rates. And power-related outages are still significant as we've seen uh, and still showing up, just some impact and trends and sampling. Network issues are noted as the single biggest cause of most of the IT service downtime incidents, no matter how bad they are, but they're reported that way. The single biggest cause of power incidents, amazingly enough, you put in a UPS or uninterruptible power system to protect you from failures but then you don't properly maintain and aggressively service and design those systems and they become a cause. And again, a consistent trend that you see, 40% of organizations, similar to the number of youths that work in and around a data center, have suffered a major outage based upon human error over that same time period of, and part of that, the key number is they don't follow the procedures or their process and procedures were inadequate or flawed. And again, about a third of data centers during 2021 lasted a full 24 hours, and that's significantly up over the last three, four, five year period. So pre-COVID to mid-COVID. What are the impacts? Data. Costly is outed, you lose some money, lost revenue, or you have a compliance failure, or a brownout or slight loss, again, losing money or productivity. What are some of the additional business impacts of downtime? Damage to your brand, your stock price, additional mitigation costs, or cost to fix and recover, and adverse re career impacts, in other words, a resume or that organization or business failed. So some of the outage impact also said, what kind of missed opportunities did we see? You have risk and opportunities. Part of that is passing capacity thresholds because you're not aggressively monitoring it. And it might be a network or power or energy or space. Capacity planning covers everything that you do, or failure of a device or software. Failing to notice that it is down and the performance is deteriorating or trending downward. So a question is, it's all downtime the same? No, not really. From an ICT reporting perspective, there can be unplanned, 
or unscheduled downtime. That's the big whoopsie. Versus periods that you have planned or scheduled downtime to maintain, upgrade, or fix a system. All sounds good, except the endpoints don't care about the difference. Downtime is downtime, no matter how many emails and alerts that are issued to tell people that planned downtime is coming. This goes back to some Ponymon studies that we use and it found very effective at ICOR over several different times. So it talks, they have some mechanisms that talk about the cost and calculating the cost of downtime. Downtime, I'm gonna move through this and there's quite a bit of more detail available in the courseware. So some of this is what are your costs, direct or indirect, and lost opportunities. And what are the consequences, just kind of popping through on the gear or the effective area or the process or procedure. So some detail on that, I'm gonna move through. How quick can you detect it? What does it cost? How quick can you contain it? And what do you need to recover from that outage? And what are the impacts of lost revenue? What kind of equipment do you need to fix, repair, buy, or refurbish? And again, how does it affect all those endpoints and user productivity, whether they're people, systems, or other businesses? And what did you have to spend on third-party costs to be able to fix it? And the impact not only on the downtime of your system, but the related impact on the business. And in addition, there's all kinds of process related activities that organizations experience when there's a problem. So Linda, I'll turn it back here for an additional poll. All right, in this tool, we only can have five bullets, so we had to combine them. So this case, choose all that apply, the three top causes of downtime that most concern you. So pick your three most out of those five. We'll give you about 10 more seconds. All right. So similar to the study that you just saw, network failure, software malfunction um, was number one with human error. Um, number two, it is interesting that um, the study that we saw had usage spikes or surges of electrical power as being a bigger issue, but that could very well be that that was a global study. And um, we, you know, we have more of a, a North American audience here today, although we know we do have people from the other side of the pond, as we say. Uh, if you'll notice here, there isn't, there aren't really three top ones. You all picked kind of four top ones with usage, spi usage spikes being the lowest, which is really interesting. Back to you, Jim. Yes, ma'am. Give me one second. My system is fighting me here. Okay. So kind of looking into a future view as we roll through. Sorry about that. Click the wrong button. Kind of everything as a service. What can be automated? What can be delivered through the World Wide Web or the Internet? And a quick then and now kind of uh, from some research, then it was prescriptive and you would have to buy and sell at your site. The now, anything as a service really simplifies and stream and you pay as you use is the theory. So some of the traditional software as a service, platform as a service, DR as a service, infrastructure as a service, communication as a service, 
buying your network as a service, database as a service, oh, desktop as a service, okay? In addition, you're starting to see hardware as a service, managed service providers provide, install the hardware that you need on demand. And you, as the customer, use the hardware according to that agreement or contract or service level that's in place. And then communication as a service and using different comms technology, whether it's instant messaging, voice over IP, video conferencing, and provided as out of the cloud. And then desktop as a service, and that's how do you manage your storage, security, and backing up of those endpoint or user data from any kind of local or desktop application. And then security as a service, the provider integrates those security services to meet your requirements and their capabilities through the internet. So whether it's dealing with antivirus, authentication, encryption, logs, et cetera. And there's healthcare as a service. And many in the healthcare industry have opted for this type of model through electronic medical records, internet of things, or related technology that allowed them to provide their medical related services. And we've seen more and more of that over the last three years, online consulting, health monitoring, medical services, outside the or lab collection versus coming on premises or into the building. Then we have transport as a service. And I'm sure all of you are using some form of this. And whether it's Uber or a taxi or similar type offices and there's all kinds of technology that is being discussed and developed out there for self-flying and self-driving planes in the future. I think I will avoid self-driving planes. Thank you. So in the future, as you kind of look at a timeline, how much flexibility do we need in, in uncertain times? How innovative can we be? How agile can be? What is the velocity of that we need to change and how quickly can I get easy and effective access to really most current or cutting edge technology? And how does it apply to big data centers and smaller data centers? And how does it help you with policy and does it give you in improved benefits? The proposed benefits for most of these save money, it's scalable, it's accessible, it's much facilitated, a much quicker implementation in many cases. You can modify, you can increase your security or get better security and help you with managing potential innovation, which is a key theme I've been seeing over the last three years. In addition, flexibility. So, some disadvantages, some risks. If the internet is not available, you may not have access to that services or it may be slowed down. If there's a slowdown and it's a shared resources, I'm sure you've all experienced that to some degrees over the last three years. When a busy time and people come to work, shared resources out there on the internet or your service provider and then how do you troubleshoot any kind of problem set you have? Are you calling a help desk? Are you trying to get to a person? Are you just filling out and dealing with the chat or artificial intelligence? And with some of these changes, where is the actual problem and how do you troubleshoot it as we get more complex and engaged and involved technologies and tools? And as you move forward, if a provider goes out of business, goes bankrupt, gets acquired, has a problem, and it does have an impact on anybody that is relying or using that service. But we see these types of services will continue to rise in the public cloud network. 
whether they're loud next to your building and waking up your neighbors, whether they run hot, okay, as we saw in a few of the videos, or whether we're not able to cool them for environmental reasons. This is with us forever, and researchers assume that global cloud computing revenue is going to continue to expand, but that's some significant dollars in a short term. And the everything is a service model by servitization, a new term, and products and services to help you run faster, be more nimble and innovative, and provide better quality services at an enhanced cost. So the future is a combination of different technologies and compute, balancing quality, cost, and better improvement. Other challenges in the future, how to save money and that more efficient and drive towards absolute power for you folks that are uh, using PUE and want to get a one-to-one -one relationship. Keeping our cool, what kind of technologies do we use and are available or are innovative as we continue to move forward based on your location of your data centers, whatever region of the planet that they are, are located in. We're still building data centers. I kind of opened up what are those design build? Is it larger? Repurposing environmental hands, future design. And our next generation are designed to have better efficiency through research and different approaches, methodology, and technology. Having different types of servers versus commodity servers. Having better power distribution and cooling technologies. Free cooling is, um, you know, it's more of efficient outside air cooling and using different cooling techniques. Picking better site selection that we started this whole thing in. And there's a trend that may be moving towards more, uh, I don't see the mega data centers going away uh, because that's a commitment and long-term, but depends on the drivers and use. And we always wanna raise the temperatures that we can operate and not affect our equipment and making improvements in the engineering and cooling efficiency, and many of these are in place and developing. And also, getting a more realistic data center power usage design and target that is more precise and designed. So before we share their thoughts, there's one other element in between there is cooling of the future. Is that immersive cooling? Are you cooling through chilled water? Are your servers going to be immersed in a non, in a dialectic? Many different things are being developed. With that being said, I will kick it back to Linda for this poll. All right, just to um, conclude our session, getting an idea of you know, to what extent has your organization considered everything as a service? Are you still providing most things in-house? And it might depend on um, what kind of organization you are, even if, you're, even if you have your private cloud, for example. I consider a private cloud in-house. Um, you might have some sources, services outsourced to the cloud. Most of us have something. And how, to really to what extent have you moved everything or most everything um, to the cloud? So we'll give about five more seconds for that. I see we're getting close to the top of the hour. So not surprisingly, most people have some, and, and I think that's probably gonna remain that way. Nobody's gonna leave the cloud, um, but the question becomes, you know, to what extent and to what level are you going to outsource everything to the cloud? So Jim, if you want to move us to just the closing slides, and I'll kind of close it up for us. I think we answered all the questions. 
um, as they came in, I answered most of the questions in the chat, so I think we're okay with that. Just to remind you, we have a bunch of courses on critical environments and how to manage your data centers, so take a look at our courses. If you could go to the next slide. And um, we, as I mentioned when we started, you can access our past webinars on our website or as, uh, on our YouTube channel as well. And we invite you to join us on May 23rd for the role of cross-functional teams in building both resilience and agility. And connect with us, follow us, um, join our network. Thank you for attending today, and we'll be getting those certificates out to you in the next few days. Thank you very much.